Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for How to Build Your Content Marketing Strategy. My name is Michael Brenner. I'm the CEO of Marketing Insider Group, and uh, you can see my Twitter handle there, so please feel free to follow me at Brenner Michael or tweet any, uh, hopefully, some uh, important insights that you might glean out of today's session, and certainly check out more information on marketinginsidergroup.com. All right, so let's get into it. So we're going to talk about how to build your content marketing strategy. So I want to start with just kind of a quick overview of all of the volume of information that's being sent out today. This is actually a slide, slide share infographic from a company called Domo in the business intelligence space. And this, uh, this graphic and some of these stats are actually about two years old. And so uh, many of the stats here have increased at a, at a pretty significant rate. But, but even as of about two years ago, you know, just look at a couple of these different stats in every single minute of the day. Uh, we're getting in our inbox about 204 million email messages. Uh, Google is seeing more than 4 million search queries. Um, Facebook users are sharing 2.5 uh, million pieces of content. Um, my favorite one is just to the left of 12 o'clock. Um, you can see there that uh, YouTube users are uploading um, in every single minute of the day more than three days worth of video content. So literally more content is being created every single minute of the day than, than we as a society, the human race, could ever possibly consume. So I want you to think about that in the context of marketing. Um, we all as consumers, uh, as content consumers, we're tuning out the noise, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but I think it, it sort of uh, ha it raises this question, how do you break through the noise? And so we're all familiar with traditional marketing techniques um, represented by this sort of sleazy salesman here, um, that, that marketing equals promotion and advertising, um, that, that we have just the thing uh, that, that, you're, that you need, and, and this is the messaging that we send out to our customers. Um, but I think the point that, that leading brands are starting to realize when we talk about content marketing is that your brand is not what you sell, um, that your brand is really a, an accumulation of all the experiences that we deliver to our customers, um, and it's not the promotional ones that we're tuning into. It's the ones that educate us, um, possibly even entertain us. And so, and so as brands, we need to think about our content as the product and not the product and, and what we're trying to sell. I'll get into a little bit more of that here later. And, and hopefully you can see this moving gif here of, of the way that I think we all feel as content consumers in this world of so much information, so much content available to us, that we just want brands to stop. We just want to stop. We're doing everything possible to avoid promotion in every situation where we're trying to consume content on the web, when we watch TV, uh, when we're listening to the radio, when we're reading anything, uh, we're trying to avoid ads as much as we possibly can. And so I love this quote to kind of sum up uh, the state of marketing today, that uh, we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in, and we need to start creating and, and, cons and, and publishing and thinking like a publisher uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the process of creating content and experiences that people are actually interested in, in reading and sharing and consuming. I love this quote, uh, content today must compete with pictures of babies and kittens and puppies. Um, and so I, I've got a little image here of, of something that I think uh, uh, one of my favorite gifs here of, of four pugs um, looking, uh, looking uh, uh, very, very seriously into the camera here. Um, if you're a cat person, then here's a couple of kittens cuddling. Um, but this is, you know, when you think about the kind of content you, that you're creating as an organization, um, do you think that it can break through uh, and, and achieve the kinds of, of attraction that these kinds of images are, are achieving? And so, so the promise of content marketing is to earn your audience versus buying it. The promise of content marketing is to attract an audience instead of trying to interrupt it. So I want you, I've got a couple, of a couple of imagine statements here. I want you to imagine that you show up first on the top web searches by the, company, by the companies or the people that you're trying to reach, by your prospects. When they go to Google, when they type something in to get, to get more educated on a solution to a problem that they have, um, where do you show up? I want you to imagine that you own the category, that, that when, uh, like L'Oreal does here with Makeup.com, um, it's not, this is not L'Oreal.com, this is Makeup.com. Somebody searching for makeup, they're going to land here and they're going to be served up um, interesting, educational, and sometimes entertaining content that helps them. Imagine that you own the target persona, the folks that you're trying to reach. Imagine that, when, that when they're looking for insights 
uh, and information to help them do their jobs better, that they would find you like, they, like uh, Adobe has done here with CMO.com. Imagine, like American Express Open Forum, that your marketing is attracting new buyers. Uh, American Express Open Forum claims that, that, that this is the largest source of inbound leads for their, for their small card division. So imagine your marketing is attracting new buyers and driving conversions and new sales. And, and imagine that you're the top resource in your industry, uh, like Cleveland Clinic with their Health Hub, that when somebody's searching for information um, in the industry overall, that they're finding you and your brand. And so quick definition of content marketing. I know a lot of folks feel confused by this term that we're all talking about. Um, what exactly is content marketing? And, and there's, there's as many definitions out there as, as there are people. And, and I think um, I try to do as much as I can to simplify things into a, a, a very um, easy to understand Venn diagram. On the left-hand side, you have what we typically publish. It's what brands produce. It's the kinds of content that we create that talks about who we are and why we're better. And on the right-hand side, you have what customers want. And, and in some cases, this is pictures of, of babies and kittens and puppies, as I've mentioned. Um, content marketing is the overlap, right? So on the left-hand side is all the stuff that you create that no one is actually interested in. It's all the stuff that, that you're creating that talks about who you are, what you sell, why you're better. And that's what largely we're tuning out. On the right-hand side is sort of charity. Let's, I'm, not, I'm not proposing that you create content about kittens and babies and puppies. Um, but there is an overlap. There's an overlap between um, your brand purpose and why you exist as an organization, the solution that you provide to the problems that your customers have, and the kinds of things that they're looking for when they're looking for help. And so content marketing is the overlap between what brands typically create and what your customers are looking for. And what this requires is empathy. It requires empathy so that you can think about what it is that your customers are looking for and how do you create that kind of content. So this is the content marketing maturity curve, and, and I, I present this uh, in a way to help you kind of understand where you might sit along this maturity curve. So uh, this quote from IDC is that the buyer journey is nothing more than a series of questions that must be answered. And the best place to answer those questions um, when we talk about content marketing, um, the first thing that brands do is they publish content to a primary channel. This is the biggest gap and one of the first steps that brands need to take when they start getting into content marketing. Um, then we move into optimizing for, for conversions, subscriptions, and offers, distributing content uh, via social channels, um, paying to distribute that content in different media outlets, measuring the ROI of your content marketing, and optimizing and targeting your distribution. So I'll walk through a process and a framework that each and every one of you can follow in order to develop your own content marketing strategy to move up and to the right in this content marketing maturity curve. So I talk about content marketing best practices a lot. And so uh, when I do strategy workshops, I spend a lot of time assessing brands um, on each of these seven best practices of the content marketing strategy. And so um, I'm going to walk through each one of them really, really quickly and then give you an opportunity to think about how well you might grade yourself on each of these different um, components of best, best practice content marketing. So do you have a documented content marketing strategy? Do you have a person or a team of people that are accountable for the content your organization is creating? Are you mapping content to the, to the buyer or your customer's journey? Are you consistently publishing quality content? Are you balancing paid, owned, and earned media? Do you focus on content subscribers, people that are opting in, people that are voting on the value of your content and inviting you into their inbox? And ultimately, are you tracking content marketing ROI? My, my, my favorite sort of story around content marketing ROI is that every single client and every single brand that I've worked with that is committed to measuring the effectiveness of content marketing has shown not just a percentage increase relative to their marketing ROI overall, but magnitudes higher return on investment, 100, 200, 400 times more effectiveness, more return on the investment in content marketing than traditional marketing techniques. And so like I said, here's each one of those same seven uh, uh, core components of best practice content marketing. And so I want you to just take a second and maybe think about how would you grade yourself against each one of these? Do you have a documented content strategy? Do you have someone that's managing it? Have you mapped your content to the buyer journey? Are you consistently publishing? Are you activating your social channels? Are you utilizing paid distribution, focusing on subscribers and measuring ROI? And so this is a somewhat detailed content marketing framework. And, and I think uh, in some subsequent sessions from today, I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into each one of these. This is a, a 
a pretty um, pretty extensive uh, slide, and, and I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed. There's about 30 questions on here that each one of you could ask, and the answers to those questions would essentially define your content marketing strategy. I'm going to touch upon a few of these today, and then uh, hopefully we'll come back and we'll dive into each one of these a little bit separately. We're going to make these slides available for you so that you can do this yourself as well, and, and I'm always here to help you out. Um, the result of that, then, is a roadmap. And, and so I've kind of estimated some timing here for looking at 2016 um, here early on, Q2, Q3, and Q4. And again, you can take each one of the answers from that framework um, and define what it is that you need to do in a step-by-step -step fashion, a roadmap, if you will, to define and get yourself and your company on the road to best practice content marketing. Okay, so again, like I said, I'm going to build – uh, through each, uh, each one of these at a very high level and just touch upon a few that I think are really important. Um, so the first thing that I often hear from companies is, um, you know, my boss is a little hesitant and resistant to the concept of, of publishing content on a brand-owned channel and investing in, in content marketing. Uh, and and it, the, what that really requires is building the business case. And the business case often comes down to something as simple as understanding that you're reaching, engaging, and converting buyers that you would have never reached if you didn't do content marketing. You're attracting an audience of folks that are doing searches on the web and that you're providing the best answer to the questions that they're asking Google. And that when you do that, if you optimize your platform, you can convert those buyers. And so you're reaching, engaging, and converting folks you would have never reached if you didn't do content marketing. And that's ultimately a summary of the ultimate business case that each brand is looking to build. Um, I actually just recently launched a book called The Content Formula, um, that helps answer these questions of how do we define the return on investment in content marketing and, and to basically give you um, or to give away uh, the core components. And, and there's about 10 actual, uh, we have a cheat sheet at the end. Um, and in that, we've got a couple of levers you can pull. And every business can look at, can look at these levers that you might be able to pull and find at least two or three, uh, at least two or three approaches that you can use to define the return on investment in content marketing. Um, I'll touch on just one of them. Um, the second bullet there under reach, uh, look at the amount of unbranded search traffic on your website. So most of the folks that come to your website are, are probably typing in your brand name or your product names. But the amount of volume of traffic in unbranded search, the category, not your product, but the category that your product is in, is often vastly larger. And if you can gain a fair share of that traffic, you could increase the traffic to your website exponentially. I'll talk about how you can do that. Um, if you look at engagement, um, one of the ways that we've been able to show the return on investment in content marketing, build the business case, is by looking at the engagement that you might be getting from content visitors versus advertising traffic. Or look at the value of the subscribers that you're able, able to drive out of your content marketing efforts. So again, um, a number of levers that you can look at here and, and, and feel free to, to download or, or to buy or, or to listen to the book, The Content Formula. You can find that at thecontentformula.com. All right, so one of the most important distinctions between effective and ineffective content marketers is that they've documented a content marketing mission statement. I've already talked about that in one of the best practices. And so here's a recipe that any company can follow. Become a premier destination for a certain target audience interested in a specific topic to help them in some way, to help your customers to deliver value to them in some way. And so while this recipe looks very simple, the outcome of this recipe is often very difficult. Uh, what we find is that uh, a lot of companies like to debate who their actual target audience is or like to debate exactly what topic you can be an expert in. But it really comes down to the expertise that resides inside your company and the answers that you can provide to the top questions that your customers are asking. And so you can become a premier destination. You are a thought leader. You are an expert on a specific topic for a certain target audience that can help some people to, to der derive or, de or deliver some customer value. The difference between content and content marketing is the destination. We'll talk a little bit about ways that you can develop a digital experience that delivers value to your customers. Um, if you're looking for some more examples, I touch upon a few here, but if you're looking for some more examples, I just published um, 99 content marketing hub examples. So you can start to get hopefully some inspiration from brands that have already um, developed, delivered, and optimized the content marketing destination. So one of the questions we often hear is, how branded should your destination be? 
And so I've already talked about makeup.com, which is owned by L'Oreal, which is completely off domain and very unbranded. You can see CMO.com by Adobe, which is very lightly branded. Um, and then you can see American Express Open Forum, which is on domain um, and pretty heavily branded. Um, and yet all of the content that they deliver is completely non-promotional. It's totally helpful to their audience. And you can see their own mission statement there, insights, inspiration, and connections to grow your business. All right, so another question we often hear, should we build on our, our, our company URL or on a separate domain? Um, and what we're starting to see is that we're starting to see companies um, that start on domain with a branded or a lightly branded content marketing hub. Um, mattress company Casper is a great example of this with their, with their blog called Pillow Talk. Um, what they found is that they had so much success with that, and they saw such a huge audience of folks that were interested in the topics that they were that they were publishing on, that they actually went out and built a completely off-domain and extremely unbranded content marketing hub called Van Winkle. So now they have a dual approach. They have an on-domain, um, lightly branded content marketing hub, and then they've matured and they've moved off property, and they're now acting like a true publisher and creating this publication called VanWinkles.com, one of my favorite examples of content marketing. Another example in the B2B technology space is Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Um, so they have their own blog on, on community.hpe.com, and then similar to, to Casper's, they've created an off-domain and lightly branded uh, uh, content marketing platform called Tech Beacon. And, and so why would a company do this? And I think the reason for this is that um, there's going to be a certain amount of traffic that you're able to attract on your branded domain, on your URL. Um, and you can provide and should provide insights and inspiration and expertise on that domain. And then there are folks that you, there's a larger group of people that you can reach once you go off domain. And there's certainly an investment that's required to do that. I know that HP Enterprise um, took about 25 to 35 people out of the organization and created a whole separate division. So there, there is investment required to do this. But um, I think the answer for most brands is to start on domain with a lightly branded content marketing hub. And then I love this uh, point about the unique point of view trap. I hear this a lot. You know, what's our unique point of view? We need to present our unique point of view. And while I think that's important along the buyer journey at some point, right, at some point people want to know who you are really and why you're different. But for the large majority of the buyer journey, your consumers don't care. And so what I, what I like to say is don't become consumed with your own story. Become consumed with your customers' needs and be uniquely valuable in delivering those customer needs. And so the way to do that is really to focus on your audience, to focus on your customers, um, to focus on the topics that they're interested in and the questions that they're asking, more so than the demographics uh, of your target persona and the features and benefits of your product. One way you can do this, again, the buyer journey is nothing more than a series of questions. And so if you simply define the questions your customers are asking at each stage of the buyer journey, then you can define a content marketing plan. You can define the kinds of content you should be creating. And I think it's really important to understand that there's 100 more people asking what is your product category and why is, why is your product category important. There's 100 more people asking that question than are asking the how do I become an expert or how do I become good at solving a certain kind of problem in your product category. And for every 10 of those, there's only one person asking you know, who sells it, how much is it, and where can I find more information. So think about the volume of content that you create today, and are you delivering 100 times more pieces of content in the early stage than you might be delivering in the late stage. And the way that you might uh, map this to the, to the funnel, and you know, the, the funnel that uh, exists in marketing, I think, as a metaphor to show mainly that there are more people at the top of the funnel asking more questions and with greater information needs than exist at the bottom. And so, you know, we're all really good at creating product content and offers and brochures and customer testimonials and case studies, but what we really need to focus on the gap that we have, it's not that we should stop doing brand and product marketing, it's that we need to fill the gap. And the gap is often in the form of, of written content, blogs and quizzes and news and infographics and video and, and visual content that really attracts the kinds of uh, uh, the audience that you're trying to target. Another visual way to show this is, is to think about the size of the audience asking those early stage questions is significantly larger than the size of the audience asking mid-stage and late-stage product questions. And this is a knowable thing. You can, you can go to certain keyword tools out there. Um, Moz Open Explorer is one. You can go to Google AdWords itself and, and really define the quantity of folks that are asking different questions at each stage of the buyer journey. 
Um, another important tip, I love this tool called BuzzSumo, buzzsumo.com. I have a pro subscription, but you can actually get about 10 results um, for free. And what you can do is you can type in any, any search term. So use your product category. Type your product category into BuzzSumo and see what's the most shared content in that category. You can type in your own domain, your own URL, and see what's the most shared content on your web website. You can type in your competitors' websites and see what's the most shared content on their sites. You can go to publisher sites and see, look at the top publisher sites in your industry and see what's the most, what's the most shared content um, on their domains. And, and then you can really get a sense for the right kind of content that you should be creating and thinking about um, from a shareability perspective. How can you create content that attracts an audience, gets them to read it, and share it to their, to their audience as well? Um, volume is important. This is something the industry talks a lot about, you know, uh, the days of, of just creating crap content are over. We need to create quality content. And, of course, that's absolutely true. You need to be the best answer on the Internet, to, to quote Brian Rhodes from Intel. Um, but you also need to focus on volume. And, and so this is a chart from HubSpot. They looked at, at thousands of websites. And what they found was that when you increase your frequency of publishing, even at an average level of quality, you're going to see higher reach, you're going to see more traffic and conversions the more often you publish. There's no diminishing return. You can see here it's actually an accelerating return when you move from once a week to once a day to once or more than once a day. And so, um, you know, it's important to think about how do you build a machine that can drive um, a volume, a frequency of quality content for your audience. Uh, what's the right mix of content? Um, you know, one of the things that I love to say is that content marketing does not have to be that expensive or difficult. Um, and the best way to start to produce content at a very low budget, if you look at the bottom, is look at your community. Leverage your current employees, your customers, the influencers, influencers in your network, and ask them if you can essentially syndicate or, or repost the content they're already creating. You can often do that for free. Um, then I would say move up from the bottom to licensed content. You can look at licensing content from publishers um, where you, you will have to pay, but you can get content at volume, quality content at volume for about a tenth of the cost of creating original content. And then, and then absolutely original content is important. And again, I think every brand that defines the most important questions their customers are asking, um, you should provide and create original content um, to provide those best answers. And so I've, got, I've provided some guidelines here on what the right mix is. Um, again, it's going to be different for each audience, but I would start with what you can get for free, what you can license from existing successful publishers and journalists, and then start thinking about how do you create the best answer um, from your own brand perspective. And then, you know, even great content needs a push, and you think about, uh, um, you think about the, the, the amazing success that, that certain blockbuster movies have. I've got a picture here of, obviously, the Star Wars, um, the latest Star Wars franchise. And, and despite all of the buzz and all the success that the, that the Star Wars franchise has had, they still spent about 50% of their production budget on distribution, on marketing, on getting the word out. And, and so you've seen Star Wars everywhere for the past couple of weeks and months. And the reason for that is that even though they have a great story to tell, and, and I saw the movie twice, so I thought it was pretty amazing, um, and, and no matter what you think that, uh, uh, about this movie particularly, even the best movies have about 50 to 60% of their budget on paid distribution. So don't forget about distributing the best content that you create. So how do we measure? Again, um, you can find this in the book, and I'm not here to sell the book, but, but really to help, uh, help each of you understand how to develop your own content marketing strategy. But, you know, begin with the end in mind. And so um, if you're looking at, at driving brand awareness or brand engagement or conversions or even retention, um, here are different metrics that, that you should be measuring to know what success looks like. Um, one thing we found is that brands that focus on subscribers are actually measuring really all, all four of these things, reach, engagement, conversion, and retention. Um, and so for, for each of you, I would say um, focus on subscriptions. How many subscribers are you able to drive with your content marketing efforts? And then whether you're looking to drive awareness, engagement, conversion, or retention, pick one or two from each of those buckets and, and define that in a dashboard. I'll show you an example of one here in a second. The value of subscribers, I've already talked about this. Um, nine times, subscribers are nine times more likely to convert than non-subscribers. And so um, whatever it is you're offering on your website, um, anyone that subscribes to your content is going to be nine to ten times more likely to convert than non-subscribers. And, and we've seen B2B buyers engage with about 20 pieces of content on average in their buyer journey, and 90% of that content um, discovery comes from their inbox. And so when you can get a subscriber, there's really a tremendous amount of value that you can provide. 
Um, as I mentioned, here's a dashboard that each one of you can use. Um, you know, you can pick your own metrics. I've got sort of a couple of reach engagement and conversion metri metrics in there. Um, you know, obviously you want to look at volume of some sort. You want to look at organic and search traffic. Um, you know, bounce rate, time spent, um, social shares, subscribers, and conversions. And then keep in mind that the volume of articles you publish and the amount of paid promotion you put behind those articles um, are variables, right? So the more you publish, the more page views you're going to get, the more paid distribution budget you have, the more page views you're going to get. But you always want to make sure that you're driving engagement and conversion um, in looking at each of those variables. And so um, this is, a, I guess, just a public service announcement. Hopefully you've gotten some value out of this. Um, here are just some, some ways that I can help. I'd, I'd love to help any one of you. Um, I offer content strategy, content development, and training services. Um, and again, I don't want to spend too much time um, in the, in the uh, uh, supporting the premise of content marketing. Hopefully you, you got some value out of this. I'd, I'd love to talk to any of you if you're interested in more. But like I said, please tune back here where I'm going to come back and share even more deeper tips along each stages of the content marketing strategy framework. Um, and so looking forward to hearing your questions coming out of that. And with that, I will just end with thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. I know you're busy. And, and uh, in, the, in the infamous words of Taylor Swift, who's from my own hometown of Reading, Pennsylvania, I love you guys. Thank you for your time. Um, I'd love to help you build something amazing. And so, uh, like I said, if you're interested, check me out at marketinginsidergroup.com or on Twitter at Brandon Michael.